You're just acting like a child. I am a child. What's your excuse? <laughs> <laughs> Oh no! I don't think it's a stretch to say that if you consume any form of media that you end up enjoying, as rare as that looks these days, you've been burned at one point or another by an ending that really didn't meet your expectations. Whether it's story focused or completely episodic, a show, movie, or video game can very easily miss the mark when they have to wrap everything they've built up with one last hurrah. Maybe the pacing is rushed and they usher so many plot points and arcs out the door half-baked that the ending loses all of its impact. Maybe there's a catastrophic collapsing consistency of the show's established rules and world building. Tonal clashes, conflicting themes, misguided interests, emotional beats feeling sloppy and unearned. Look, we can play this game all day, but the point is, I really hate Star Wars the I really hate bad endings, and I'm sure you do as well. And if you're looking for a bad ending factory, then look no further in the world of animation, specifically when it comes to western cartoons. I'm only choosing not to count anime because, uh, Christ, where would I begin there? There are a large number of animated shows, even ones that aren't usually story focused, that quickly build up a dedicated fan base who greatly enjoy the show and are either fully engaged with its story or simply find it incredibly entertaining. And then when faced with the task of wrapping everything up, end up causing the worst catastrophe known to men since my sleep schedule. There's a lot of things that can cause this. Oftentimes a show is cancelled suddenly and they have to try and wrap up what they originally planned out in half their expected time. And sometimes the explanation is just far more simple, like the writing being completely inept fumbling and bumbling around with their time and destroying all the goodwill they had garnered years prior with a long drawn out explosion of incompetence. We have plenty of shows to choose from, many of which you have heard me discuss before on this channel, so I hope with this video I can not only provide a good summary on why these finales utterly and miserably failed, but I can also cover new information regarding their downfall. I have gathered 8 shows to talk about for today's video, I don't plan on staying on one subject for very long. This video's pacing will be equivalent to a sewage drain. I've even organized a little tier list to keep track of where we are. Tears going from tolerable, bad, darn, what were they thinking? Weezer must stay in my Spotify playlist at all times. And with that, I think we're ready to drop straight into... I wanted to get the obvious ones out of the way first, and given how many times I've referenced this show over the years, and given the fact that a lot of you probably clicked on this video to hear me talk about it, I think we should get it out of the way first. I actually owe quite a lot to Star Versus and this ending, being the first video of mine that really took off and allowed me to get to where I am now. So as a result of this ending merely existing, it allowed me to start a career on this website for better or for worse. So thanks Darren, I think, but surely you don't need me to lecture you all on how bad this ending was, because I think this might be one of the most notorious endings to an animated show uh, ever. So many videos and angry posts across the internet delving deep into how badly it screwed up on a thematic level, storytelling level, characters, world building, basic conflict and resolution, it's a total train wreck. But I'll go over the basics either way. Season 4 of Star Vs was already receiving pretty mixed reception from fans of the series. From the rushed plot development to the frustrating filler episodes that wasted precious time that could have been spent making other aspects of the story work better, and the absolutely insufferable romantic subplots and shipping wars that began and gnawing their way into the story with the subtlety of a bad driver in a Los Angeles freeway, breaking apart characters and then smashing them back together to create the illusion of drama, bringing characters together and then three episodes later breaking them up off screen. And the less I talk about the messaging and the whole racism allegory, the better, because my god it is a two, two pack, pack of, of ass. ass. And this is all before the actual finale, which technically spans across a few different episodes, but it is notorious, notorious, for throwing everything out the window. All of the time the show spent f***ing around with random out of nowhere filler episodes, choosing to focus on fake unsubstantial relationship drama instead of developing the main plot and characters, all of it came back to bite the show bad. It should actually be award worthy to have this many ass pulls in one finale. Moon betraying Eclipsa like 15 episodes after it's been shown that the two are on good terms and are putting the past behind them, just because Moon is still butthurt and wanted the chance to jeopardize everything. The hero's ultimate solution to stop Mina from committing mass genocide and bring peace to Muni, Star's home if you're unfamiliar, is to destroy the magic entirely, which has the side effect of killing potential millions of magical beings in the universe, except not really, for a handful of characters which makes no sense at all. And yes, I'm still upset that Ponyhead is still canonically breathing oxygen to this very day, effectively committing mass genocide in order to stop a genocide. It still hurts my brain to this day. Mina gets jumped and taken out by a unicorn out of nowhere instead of having one last fight, Marco gets stabbed and wounded by a unicorn and the show lingers on it having consequences only for it to be magically healed five minutes later. And despite the removal of magic forcing Star and Marco to remain in their separate worlds, suddenly both Earth and Muni merge 
merge together to create a living hellscape of the entire planet in chaos, just because the writers wanted Star and Marker to be together no matter the consequences. Do you see why I'm happy that Amphibia kept the world separate? And this is barely scratching the surface of what went wrong with this ending, but even from a basic description, I think you get the picture. Hell, if you remember Toffee, the main and superior antagonist of the series until Star hit him with the Oppenheimer style in Season 3, you'd know that his motives are tied to the fact that he is a monster and therefore part of an oppressed group on Muni. He is then killed. Then Mina, a member of the not-subjugated race, is just allowed to live and roam free after almost killing every monster on the planet. Talk about catastrophic metaphor collapse, yikes. Every aspect of this ending was so bad that it genuinely harmed how people view the show overall. People forget that Star vs was almost universally beloved in its first two seasons, and knowing that all of this was intentional, no cancellations or production issues, just rubs extra salt in the wound. As a conclusion, it failed on every possible level, and left a horrid taste in the mouths of fans worldwide even four years after it showed us mercy and ended. What a great way to start off this video by slamming this one in Weezer tier. Weezer's not actually that bad, so just pretend I'm referring to Ratitude. <laughs> Steven Universe is a show that I have an incredibly complicated relationship with, a sentence that has never once been uttered on the internet, I'm sure. And this ending isn't really universally hated, it's more so incredibly controversial. Uh, both of them. Steven Universe ended twice, well, three times if you count the movie, but the endings for the original series and future are not only incredibly different, but both are also equally as controversial. But why is this? Well, the cause is actually fairly simple. Corporate Theatrics Steven Universe was a show fairly renowned for its LGBTQ representation and its fifth season was going to go the extra mile by showcasing a full gay wedding between Ruby and Sapphire, the two characters in the show that fused to create Garnet. However, Rebecca Sugar was met with a surprising amount of disdain from Cartoon Network who advised her not to do it. CN was known for being pretty accepting of LGBT themes in a few of their programs for a few years up to that point, so for a lot of people this really did come out of nowhere, seemingly wanting to stick to safe representation that they could potentially edit and change for overseas markets without much controversy, meanwhile stifling anything that tries to go beyond the status quo. As a result of Rebecca sticking to her guns over this wedding, Steven Universe was cancelled and that mere cancellation is why the show's fifth season and final story arc are so damn rushed. It was a mad dash towards the finish line. Now in fairness, Steven Universe's quality has always been up in the air for most people. It was first and foremost a show that made you feel things and the things that made many people feel were genuinely captivating. Unfortunately, they were still trying to tell a huge story story with lore and world building that featured a rebellion against genocidal dictators, the Diamonds. Season 5 really tried to go all out when it could, but it was still bogged down by the show's utter fascination with writing filler episodes right after an important story moment, which severely ruined the show's pacing and a lot of people's engagement, especially as the gaps between episodes grew larger and larger, not to mention that many of the show's big twists received mixed reactions, such as Rose Quartz turning out to be Pink Diamond all along, and the show's finale greatly fumbled the bag by redeeming the diamonds, a decision that would forever tarnish the show's legacy as something to be mocked and ridiculed due to how it had the balls to put three genocidal tyrants on a redemption arc with incredibly rushed character developments. To soften the blow of the story being rushed, the finale tried to cram in as many fan service moments as possible, with a ton of new fusions, some moments of genuinely beautiful animation, etc etc, but by this point the show's emotional beats had run hollow with not enough narrative weight to support them, and the dialogue specifically was at an all time low. Low. Steven Universe's ending isn't the worst thing I've ever seen, mind you, but it is undoubtedly controversial. Then we arrive at Steven Universe Future, an epilogue series that dives deep into Steven as a character. It's very different to the original show, and even though I was originally quite harsh on it, though I still don't think it's very good, I've grown to appreciate the series for what it attempted to do, which was admittedly novel and pretty ballsy, going deep into Steven's underlying trauma and daring to ask the question of what if this optimistic pacifist responsible for saving the world and toppling an empire through kindness finally snapped and had enough of being everyone's babysitter. It's an interesting concept and the moments where Steven loses it are honestly quite shocking. The issue is that regardless of whether or not Steven's trauma manifests in this latest realistic, the show makes a number of missteps by having his meltdowns be incredibly extreme to the point where he lashes out at his dad and almost gets him killed in a car crash, yells at a victim of his mother's abuse because he's tired of hearing bad stories about her, and generally acting like he has completely and utterly lost his marbles instead of it simply being a result of extreme 
extreme PTSD, like when he makes the insane decision to propose to Connie, which felt like an incredibly artificial way to put him on a downward spiral. Future both added and destroyed aspects of Stephen's character, and by the end of the series, most people were left very conflicted. I don't think it's the utter atrocity I thought it was years ago, but it's definitely an odd series and a very odd way to end Steven Universe as a series. Samurai Jack is one of my favourite animated series. Period. From the striking animation, the enforced importance of its gorgeous visual storytelling, and all, it remains as one of the best offerings I've seen from Western animation, and made me a huge fan of Gendy Tartakovsky's work. Now, I was like two months old when the show was cancelled, so it didn't really have as big of an effect on me as it did for many others who were interested and invested in the show. But when I rediscovered it as I grew older, I was left with a crippling desire to see more. So in 2017, when we finally got a trailer for a fifth Samurai Jack season, that not only sought to conclude the series, but would also be airing on Adult Swim, finally granting it the ability to be darker, more mature, and to feature some genuinely impactful violence within the beauty of its action scenes, a lot of people were excited, me included. And when we got season 5, it was even better than we could have imagined. I maintain that the first 7 episodes of Samurai Jack season 5 are the peakest of fictions, but after these 7 episodes demonstrated why Tartakovsky was such a master of his craft and showed Samurai Jack at its quality peak, Something strange happened. Episode 8 felt tonally borked in comparison to the rest of the season, which was incredibly dark and mature, instead opting for a more comedic adventure in line with some of the show's earlier episodes. It was jarring, but not the end of the world. The season already had humorous moments and did them rather well, but this episode was a full-on comedy, and after Jack epically declared in the last episode that his next and final goal was defeating Aku, to suddenly be slapped with this felt very weird. Not helped by the sudden romance blossoming between the new character Ashi and Jack. It was a little weird considering Jack is like mentally in his 70s due to all the time travel bull but the main problem is that it threw romance into the mix of Samurai Jack's finale and it's not like it was even all that good. It was a poor distraction that muddied the writing and pacing, especially when Aku pits Ashi against him and he can't bring himself to kill her, willingly giving himself up and bringing his journey to an end because he doesn't have the heart to kill a girl who has been a part of his life for like a week. The final episode attempts to cram a ton of fan service and references to previous episodes within the plot, as everyone Jack had met across the series returns to help him defeat Aku, but it's again rushed and loses all of its impact. Besides this one scene, which will always be funny. <laughs> Granted, the finale does get better towards the end, seeing Jack finally return to the past to the first episode of season 1, and with absolutely no hesitation for Aku's bullshit charges and slices him with his sword, never relenting for even a second as he finally strikes the Aku that he had previously weakened down to the ground, letting out the most cathartic scream after a lifetime of hopelessness and torment. <laughs> The thing that really ruins this ending, though, is the existence of Ashi at all. Due to being a daughter of Aku, Ashi is negatively affected by his death, but for some reason takes until the moment Jack has a wedding with her much later to fade away as she was never meant to exist, depriving Jack of his much-deserved happy ending for a cheap death scene that doesn't make any sense. Why did she not fade away the second Aku had died? She clearly dropped to the floor here, it was the perfect time to do it. Why make Jack suffer on his wedding day? The final scene is beautiful depressing and maybe shed a tear, but it doesn't change the fact that this was an incredibly disappointing ending to what should have been the best season of the show. Hell, Gendy must have been aware of the ending's rather mixed reception because in 2020 we got a Samurai Jack tie-in game, displaying an alternate scenario that plays out instead of the immediate fight between Jack and Aku. In this game, Ashi is allowed to live in the present with Jack even after Aku's demise due to a time pocket copy of the future preventing her from piecing the fuck out. And to add further insult to the original ending, Gendy confirmed the game is the official official canon ending of the series, rendering the original ending meaningless. Greetings, you know cartoon community. Teen Titans Go has been out for 10 years. Please stop talking about it. Anyway, Teen Titans is another one of my favourite shows to come from Cartoon Network. It's not nearly as good as Jack, but it's still a standout show worthy of its legacy, and I still think it's one of the best portrayals of the Teen Titans in anything, really. Not exactly a high bar, I understand, but you gotta respect the OG series somehow. They just don't make action shows for kids like this anymore. And the way it blended humour, drama, and action together without ever ruining the tone was immensely valued by a legion of dedicated fans who were still butthurt about the Poopy Poopy Farto show 10 years after after it first aired. You guys could have started families within that time, or at least make yourselves lesser disappointments to your current one. Back on track, Teen Titans was cancelled. Why? 
didn't sell enough toys, I presume. That seems to be the main reason Cartoon Network can stuff and why we ended up with five Ben 10 shows and a movie that looks like this. But despite being cancelled, Teen Titans still had an ending. It was a cliffhanger ending for sure, but it still made the effort to put out an episode that had a sense of finality. This is the first ending on this list that isn't necessarily bad, but really sticks with you upon watching it, making you angry about how the show could have properly wrapped up everything if it had the time to do so. I appreciate that it didn't try to rush out a crapshoot finale and stuck to something far more simple. An ending that acknowledges that the show is over. It's not bad at all, just really frustrating. Beast Boy and Terra's parts are heartbreaking and while it isn't the ending most of us expected and it's alright to be disappointed by it, it's still an alright end to the series. Just tolerable really. Knowing there could have been so much more in store is its main problem. Now let's go over some rapid fire reviews, endings that are pretty simple to explain and don't require an extensive knowledge of the series in order to acknowledge the faults. The Fairly Odd Parents is a show that didn't end with a finale because at heart it's an episodic comedy. It used to be one of Nickelodeon's finest cartoons and Butch Hartman's unfortunate claim to fame. However, as many have covered extensively, Odd Parents fell off a long time ago, but it didn't just fall off. The show sort of forgot how to TV show. It wasn't just painfully unfunny and devolved straight into mean-spirited nonsense, but it became very clear as new seasons came out that no one actually cared about the show's writing. It felt very much like I turned in a first draft for every episode, with a complete absence of the fast-paced absurd comedy that made the series entertaining originally, replacing it for bare-bones slapstick, bad jokes exclusively at Timmy's expense, and plots so shockingly paper-thin they make Pepper Pig look like Shakespeare. Couple this with several jumpings of the metaphorical shark that the show designed to switch the Flash animation in its last few seasons, which somehow looks worse than the show's pilot from the 90s, and you have a show that was pretty much trying, begging to finally be cancelled. Ratings were at an all time low, and the show ended with a random mundane episode that sucked balls. Weezer. The Amazing World of Gumball is another one of the best shows to ever come from Cartoon Network and if you've been keeping up with the news surrounding it lately, you may be confused as to why it's even here. Currently, there's not only a movie continuation of the show in development after escaping David Zaslav's jail for creative potential, and a seventh season is currently in production with no release date as of now. However, it has to be stated that for the longest time after the season 6 finale, the future of the show was pretty uncertain, with the creator stating in 2016 that the show would be ending then and there, and with brief unsubstantiated rumours of a movie being in development, things were not certain at all for this show, which is why the original ending is here, because it's an incredibly strange case to talk about. The episode itself plays out like a regular episode of Gumball with a ridiculous and visually creative premise involving a live action superintendent coming to Elmore to remove all the cartooniness. It's definitely a Gumball episode, not the best Gumball episode by any metric, but it's a decent bit of fun. Until the last few minutes, where suddenly Rob, a character who had previously shown up as a joke villain and a meta commentary on forgotten characters, is revealed as the man behind the strings, claiming he was trying to save everyone from their inevitable demise, but no one listens to him. And then, in a surprisingly chilling scene, the world around Rob begins to crumble as he falls back into the void, with the episode ending on a freeze frame with this jingle. <laughs> It's genuinely f***ing terrifying, and this would have been a great ending to the show if we had confirmation it was going to be followed up on at some point, but we were left in the dark for so long on this that the memory of it lives in infamy as an average episode that got marred by a pretty interesting cliffhanger that went nowhere, and we still don't really know what the plot of the movie will be like or what the seventh season is even going to be like. We're kind of stuck in this area where we know Gumball is going to continue someday, but until then, this is the ending we got, and while I can tolerate it, it really isn't good as an ending. Now, here's an oddball you probably weren't expecting. Now, I'm secure enough to admit I'm a big fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, but Sonic's surprisingly extensive TV career utterly confounds me. Despite me having plenty of good memories watching them as a kid, none of them are really all that good or worth the curiosity today, although Sonic X deserves to be remembered for this line alone. How did you pass security? I pretended I was a bar of soap and gave them all the slip. Sonic Sad AM, though, is a show that I consider to be a guilty pleasure, and I'm still surprised at how popular it is within the Sonic fandom. Being a much darker show than whatever adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog was, but still being true to Sonic as a character. Not all that great, but I'd say it's worth a watch. 
Well, I would, but there's a big reason why I don't really care for the story all too much. Not only is the ending bad, but the show was supposed to be continued at some point. First off, the episode does start out pretty good with some honestly good build-up, but it really eats it towards the end. The deep power stones are effectively just magic ways for everything in the story to suddenly no longer matter as the high stakes of the episode are obliterated once Sonic and Sally use them, causing them to become completely all-powerful and proceed to destroy Robotropolis and save the day. The entire series has been about nature versus technology and the difficult struggle the freedom fighters are constantly facing at the hands of Dr. Robotnik. To suddenly have a magic solution once the situation turns dire utterly ruins the impact of the entire series and any reason to care for this ending. The cliffhanger at the end is also annoying because there was a very clear intent of continuing the series had ABC not cancelled it. This isn't a Teen Titans scenario where they kind of knew they were being cancelled. This is a series that wanted to go even further and we just didn't get a follow up. However, there is a fan project creating an entire third season from the ground up. It's received help from people who worked on the original show and from many industry professionals. It's still in development, but at least the series is going to get a continuation someday, official or not. However, officially, this is where the series ended and it's really stuck with me ever since I was a kid. So we've seen what happens when a Butch Hartman cartoon with no emphasis on story ends up dead in a gutter. So what happens when you have a Butch Hartman cartoon with an actual story take a bullet? Honestly, it's pretty easy to explain where Danny Phantom went wrong. It was a Butch Hartman show that tried to end. I loved the show as a kid, still do, but God, I do not understand what they were trying to do with the show's ending. Like, the evil mayor hires a team of expert ghost hunters to effectively replace Danny Phantom, and the episode constantly treats Danny like a moron by making him seem utterly incompetent and just not able to use his ghost powers in a fight, resulting in him constantly being humiliated and the ghost hunters replacing him in the eyes of the public. Then, when these ghost hunters come for his parents, this leads to Danny having enough of the stress of having to manage a double life as a superhero and gets rid of his powers supposedly for good in order to keep his loved ones safe. Only for his friends, as Holes to completely blow him off and treat him like an average everyday loser now that he's a normal kid, completely ungrateful for Danny trying to keep them safe, actively avoiding him, and making it look like as if the only reason they were ever friends of him was because he was secretly a superhero, when that is 100% not the case, but this is a Butch Hartman cartoon attempting to write drama, I should have been expecting that. The biggest sting of it is that the episode tries to make you against Danny for this decision, like he's somehow being incredibly selfish and that his friends are in the right, even though what they're saying is like... <laughs> horrible? The episode spends the entire time treating Danny like a victim and pushing him to his absolute limit. Why the f*** does it then turn around and treat him as if he's being selfish for wanting it to end? Then there's a giant meteorite made out of ecto something I do not care. And this has never ever existed in the show at any point in the past, but now it's suddenly a thing that exists and is basically invincible against ghost powers, causing the mayor's plan of making it phase through the earth go kaput because something exists now that has never existed before, and they treat it as if it's always been a thing this entire time, I'm falling asleep just talking about this. Oh yeah, then Danny gets his powers back by being blasted by ghosts for some reason. Like, he doesn't die and become Danny Phantom, he just absorbs it and gets his powers back. It's really stupid. That should have just hurt him, like, every other time in the series where he gets hit with ghostly sh**. Anyway, I'm not gonna bother explaining how they deal with the asteroid, I kinda just wanted to look at it. Just like, look at this. It's stupid. I probably could have given a more lengthy explanation, but Phantom Planet is not only really bad, it's also just ungodly boring. You could probably feel how, how much I just didn't want to talk about it. I'm going to end this video off of a few pearls of wisdom. Stop writing cartoons that feature the topic of genocide if you're unable to write it with respect. If your show is ending, please don't rush everything out the door in one fell swoop and do what's possible even if your story doesn't officially end. If your name is Butch Hartman, please stop. And if you have to do a Reddit AMA to explain away parts of your writing, there lies the issue. I, I, I still can't believe this surreal thing she wrote.